Elman appears, a flying fish whispered, pioneering Caribbean literature. I'm so glad you decided to read this early example of Caribbean literature. Elman appears, a flying fish whispered, was published in 1938, becoming one of the earliest novels by a Caribbean author to be published in the 20th century. While she was not born in Dominica, Napier embodies the spirit of Caribbean authors of her own generation and of those to come. Indeed, while Flying Fish Whispered may not be a perfect novel that ties all the plots together in a seamless manner, it does allow us to see significant tropes found throughout Caribbean literature. I hope this presentation will showcase how the novel is a pioneering example of Caribbean writing. Elman Napier, pictured on the right, by only indications, was an incredible woman of her time. As a member of upper-class society, she used her advantages to the fullest, traveling around the world and meeting people from all around the British Empire and the rest of the world. This travel made her a very cosmopolitan woman who learned from others' experiences, which influenced her to see the world very differently from the typical British expat. And according to her marvelous introduction to the book, one I highly recommend reading for more context, Evelyn O'Callaghan notes how unusual the Napiers were in their time. White, British, and privileged they were, yet they could not have been more different from the rest of Dominica's tiny white expatriate society, mostly colonial officials. One reason for this difference is that colonial officials often lived on the islands temporarily, with promises to return to England. Elman Appear, though, made Dominica her home and tried to make it better for its people. For instance, she campaigned for the construction of the Transinsular Road, which connected the north and south areas of the island. In many ways, her fiction and other writings also unified the island. To return to her differences with other white people in Dominica, Napier also was different from Creoles, whites of European descent who were born and or raised on the islands. For more discussion of this population, please watch my video on Jean Reefs on my YouTube channel. Being white and British, but not part of either the bureaucracy and or aristocracy, allow Napier to have an insider's perspective with the sympathy for and outlook of native residents. You can see the contrast between these groups from the book in the morels, e.g. Derek, who is a Creole from Parham Island slash Antigua, and Janet, who is an expat with Scottish origins, and in Tommy and Teresa, e.g. both longtime residents of St. Celia slash Dominica, who start to defend the rights of the black people of the island. O'Callaghan finds that the novel radically critiques colonial rule in its racist matrix. Keenly aware of racial inequalities and the impotence of colonial dependency, the novel occasionally sparks with rage at imperial exploitation of the West Indies and its people. O'Callaghan also labels this novel and its project as proto-feminist, a term I interpret to suggest the fight for women's rights while not exactly aligning all women with those rights. Indeed, one problem in the novel is the narrator's exclusion of the black female servants around issues pertinent to feminist issues, such as birth control, economic stability, and domestic abuse. Regardless of its shortcomings, Napier's novel tries to portray Dominica, both its nature and its people, with honesty and respect. The map on the left shows the Lesser Antilles, the group of islands between the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean. Dominica stands in the middle of the leeward and westward islands of these Lesser Antilles, belonging to the leeward group of islands. The map on the right shows the entire island of Dominica. The interior of the country is dominated by two national parks outlined in green. There are lots of rivers and waterfalls throughout the country. Since a flying fish whispered is fiction, the various settings are not exactly on this map of northern Dominica. However, Calabishi, Napier's home, and Portsmouth, Grand Inks, the major town they travel to, are on this map. The Morals Estate would most likely be near Calabishi. The real-life battle of beach access occurred in Woodford Hill in Wesley. Dominica was discovered by Columbus, who arrived there on Sunday, hence its name. According to researcher Christina Headley, 
Most of the native population of Dominica is descended from African slaves who were brought there to work the plantations during the 17th and 18th centuries. The most recent data from the Dominica census as of 2011 listed the population to be approximately 72,000 people. Dominica is one of the Caribbean's most beautiful and naturally preserved islands. According to the national website for Dominica, Dominica is officially described as the following. Uniquely natural, naturally unique, a rich tapestry of lush rainforest, rivers and waterfalls with volcanic wonders on land and under the sea. The people of Dominica welcome you to share the beauty and tranquility of nature's island. To discover the rich culture of the people, an enriching ecotourism experience, the physical challenge of extreme adventure, or the serenity of a secluded spa retreat. When you discover Dominica, you discover yourself, and a Caribbean experience like no other. Indeed, the national motto, after God is Earth, and its flag represent the country's natural wonder. The flag of Dominica uses a tricolor cross design superimposed across a green field. The cross consists of three vertical and horizontal bands of yellow, black, and white, representing, respectively, the native population, the soil, and purity of the water. A red circle or disc is centered in the flag's field. Within the circle is the indigenous Susuro parrot, Dominica's national bird, which is encircled by ten green stars representing the island nation's ten parishes. A beautiful flag to match the beautiful country. Aside from the natural wonders, Dominica has a population of indigenous Kalanago, formerly known as the Carib Indians, of around 2,500 people. The Kalanagar are one of the last surviving indigenous populations to live in the Caribbean islands. This population lives primarily on reserve territory in eastern Dominica. The picture on the right shows this territory. The Kalanagos survived in part because of Dominica's isolation and topography. Dominica's volcanic makeup has allowed it to sustain a natural beauty that many islands in the Caribbean lost during the colonial period. Additionally, the government has two massive natural parks on the island to maintain this beauty. Its mountainous rainforest climate made settlement slow and difficult and contributed to a unique type of tourism compared to other islands. Indeed, Dominica was the last of the West Indian islands of any consequence to become accessible by airplane. It could be reached only by boat until the early 1970s. Because of this isolation, Dominica has been able to preserve and cherish its natural wonders and its indigenous culture. Bowling Lake, located in the Southern National Park, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is perhaps the most famous natural feature on the island with countless natural and unadulterated features. For this reason and others, Dominica was a major film location for Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. You can take tours related to this film and others. However, Dominica is one of the leading countries in the world for ecotourism, which is tourism driven by the environment and its natural beauty. Almost a miniature Costa Rica, the gold standard of ecotourism, Dominica has started to change how ecotourism operates in the Caribbean. Ecotourism often carries a bad name in the Caribbean due in part to the cruise industry that does not promote sustained interactions with and or appreciations for natural beauty in its preservation. For this reason and others, ecotourism may need to be rethought in the Caribbean. Dennis Gale found in 1997 that the Caribbean requires sustainable tourism that balances short-term needs with the rise of natural capital, with simultaneously ensuring its long-term supply. Sustainable tourism differs from traditional ecotourism because it is based on the understanding of the sectoral impact upon the natural cultural, human, and economic environments, leading to the development of reliable methods of environmental accountability, inclusive consultation, and an equitable distribution of benefits as well as cost. As of 2009, Dominica may be embarking on a more sustainable method for ecotourism. Vanessa Slinger Friedman finds that the model of ecotourism found in Dominica shows significant local benefit through ownership, management, and general employment opportunities, as well as a potentially higher multiplier effect due to greater linkages between tourism and other sectors of the economy. 
So far, government policy in Dominica has been beneficial to small-scale, locally-owned facilities. And with the ecotourism's focus on natural features and rural locations, this type of development has occurred throughout the island. In many ways, Dominica stands as a model for other islands to emulate. No wonder the Napiers found their forever home among this island and its people. Dominica's history has been dominated by its relationship and location to its surrounding neighbors, the former French colonies Guadeloupe and Martinique. The novel depicts some of the tensions that existed regarding the various raiders and opportunists that arrived from these islands onto Dominica. The image on the left shows Dominica in relation to the rest of the Lesser Antilles. The image on the right shows the proximity of Dominica to its closest neighbors. The proximity directly impacted Dominica's history, particularly in regards to slavery. Guadeloupe and Martinique both had large plantation systems. Socially, Dominica's complex history had left it suspended between French mores and English institutions, a fact that still marked it deeply at the turn of the 20th century. Dominica had not been successfully settled until the mid-18th century, and then only by French sugar planters from the neighboring islands of Martinique and Guadeloupe. It changed hands repeatedly between the French and English during the 18th century, and despite coming firmly under English control in 1805, remained, well until the 20th century, a French colony at heart. Indeed, the two official languages of Dominica are English and French Patois. While it is not a thriving plantation colony like its immediate neighbors or islands of the Greater Antilles, i.e. Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Cuba, Dominica's history is still dominated by slavery, as plantations were started in the island and as a haven for escaped and freed slaves from surrounding islands. Still, an estimated 127,436 enslaved Africans were brought to Dominica, ranking it sixth among Britain's ten main Caribbean colonies. In comparison, the British imported an estimated 164,869 enslaved Africans on Antigua, or Param Island in the book. These estimates are more astounding when you consider the size of the islands. Dominica is approximately 290 square miles, nearly the size of Charlotte, North Carolina. On the other hand, Antigua is approximately 108 square miles, nearly the size of Savannah, Georgia. However, the island's rugged terrain and poor communications by force kept the size of plantations small, and the topography had always made the black population much less dependent on plantation work than in other islands. There had been in Dominica, even before emancipation in the 1830s, large settlements of free black and mulattoes who owned land or lived as squatters in abandoned or neglected estates. We can see several examples of this situation in the novel. Still, the plantation economy of the Caribbean during the colonial period defined even Dominica. Archaeologist Mark Hauser investigated how plantations were organized and developed on the island. He finds, while small islands like Dominica were relatively underdeveloped and economically marginal, they were nonetheless subject to the same boom cycles of plantation economies. Additionally, the cultures of the enslaved influenced life on Dominica. The social and economic networks of enslaved Africans caught up in the distinctive mode of settlement continued to be shaped locally and on the ground. And while our novel takes place in the 20th century, we can still see the lingering effects of slavery among the characters, particularly in Tilly, who wants to satisfy her matron as she's dying. Miss Teresa, the cauliflower's on the stove. The cauliflower's on the stove. While the book has autobiographical elements, A Flying Fish Whispered is a work of fiction. Teresa is not Elma Napier, even though they share political sentiments and background. The book also is partially based on a real incident regarding beach access at Wood Ford Hill in Wesley, which led to the Napiers getting a legal guarantee to the right of the Dominicans to access their beaches. One shortcoming of the book is the narrator's often mishandling of black characters. While the book and its authors are not racist in my evaluation, I think Teresa's admissions reflect her privilege, class, and race. For instance, Teresa is shocked that the blackness of a Negro's skin was so thin that it could shrivel away and expose white flesh whiter than her own. This realization evokes fear in her mind, first from the scene itself that causes this whiteness to occur, and second from the flesh 
of a stark staring whiteness. The trauma of this scene regarding Tilly alters Teresa permanently. Although the narrator's language is a tad insensitive to our current ears, I think it shows how Teresa is trying to come to terms with another person's humanity, especially a person who has been historically and economically disadvantaged compared to herself. I will let you explore Teresa's complete evolution as a character and person with your own reading and interpretation. The Pierce's true achievement in the book is her ability to capture life both flora and human. O'Callaghan agrees, noting how Napier achieves mastery. Verbally painting scenery, she never falls into the trap of arranging natives as picturesque adornments to the prospect. They emerge rather as vivid personalities whose lived realities are clearly familiar to the author. For this reason and others, I think we end up rooting for Teresa and the story she embodies. As I said in the previous slide, I will let you make the final interpretation of Teresa. While the book is not a traditional buildings or mom or coming of age story, the Flying Fish Whisperer does track the main character's change. O'Callaghan interprets the book's structure well. It is divided into three sections which track the path of Teresa's sexual intoxication, breakdown, reflection, and insight, and the consequences for a change of heart in the social and personal spheres. The titles of the sections reflect the significant plot moments in her journey, except for the generalized title of The Interlude. While this part may be rather unconventional and unbalanced with the rest of the novel's romance theme, the interlude makes the novel more significant, and it helps to show how the book is a powerful example of Caribbean literature. Again, O'Callaghan explains, The several chapters which make up interlude are pivotal in signaling the binary opposition set up in the novel between Teresa, in and out of love, the social order of colonial slash Parham Island, and the Creole St. Celia relationships between the sexes and between humans and the land. O'Callaghan is correct to focus on the binary oppositions in the novel, which is an important method of analysis for post-colonial interpretations. However, the interlude signals Napier's awareness of distinct Caribbean histories and experiences, differences that make political action imperative to Caribbean life. It would have been easy to write a romance of Dominica through her characters. Everyone would have been happy. Yet Napier chooses to concentrate on how this romance dissolves, particularly along political and cultural borders between the participants. By engaging the political dimension alongside the culture and beauty of the island, Napier is pioneering what Caribbean literature will do in the future. As a final slide, I want to talk about nature in the novel. Nature is the crux of the conflict in the novel, for it becomes the main reason for the end of Teresa and Derek's romance. In the slide above, I have listed three examples of the many ways nature works in the novel. In the first example, Teresa recalls seeing manatees at the botanical gardens, full of life and loving their surroundings. Whereas in London, the manatees are sterile and unable to thrive, and they are forced lettuce to eat instead of grass. In the second example, nature forgives man's ugliness. And finally, nature anchors Teresa's world. She is surrounded by beauty and appreciates it in minute detail, such as the sun's lasting effect on leaves. She also rather suggestively equates nature to people's behaviors, such as the roosters or men in Cape Terra. Napier's attention to detail regarding nature is profound and revolutionary, pioneering what later writers will learn to celebrate and cherish about the Caribbean. In terms of literary and cultural history, the colonial landscape, at once strange and domestic, a place belonging to Britain yet abroad, created an altogether different set of problems. It could be beautiful, lavish, and lush, but it, so too could it confront the viewer with epistemological difficulties that destabilize meaning and certainty. And when that viewer has stepped up to the landscape as a colonist, imbued with authority, expecting to oppose his or her will upon a foreign land as a matter of routine, or because change was deemed imperative, then questions not unnaturally arose. While this last quote above mentions a walled-in garden, Teresa chooses to look beyond it and appreciate the wonders beyond her place. As Richard Grove in his monumental and excellent study, Green Imperialism, Colonial Expansion, Tropical Island Edens, and the Origins of Environmentalism reminds us, the Caribbean often sparked white residents of European descent to become mad because 
the landscapes of island and garden were metaphors of mind. This concept becomes important in Jean Reef's Wide Sargasso Sea, for instance. Colonialism affected how nature worked, especially in the Caribbean, where the land was used and misused for economic gain. Significantly, part of this reality became the interest in a new imperialism. Historian Peter Hume explains this term. Within this British Empire, there's an openly racial distinction between the self-governing colonies, no longer thought of as dependencies, and the tropical colonies, which are still dependent. In the self-governing colonies, such as Australia and Canada, British Prime Minister Joseph Chamberlain in 1897 said, the sense of possession had given way to a sense of kinship, while in the tropical colonies, such as the West Indies, it had given way to a sense of obligation. Dominica becomes the test case for new imperialism, where neglect could be reversed to maximize the productiveness of the soil. Derek's character embodies this mentality. O'Callaghan finds that the novel seeks a different understanding of nature. It embodies and promotes a different kind of relationship to the land than that of the tourist, however, and savagely critiques the human and environmental consequences of British colonization. A flying fish whispered constitutes a pioneering attempt way ahead of its time to engage with feminist and ecological discourses. Napier, through her protagonist, encourages a robust love of nature. O'Callaghan agrees. Theresa romantically puts her faith in Crobian nature, which will resist and outlast human destruction. This attachment to nature emerges from a woman's travel writing tradition, which in the West Indies tends towards the sentimental rather than the scientific, the literary or poetic rather than factual, and frequently assumes a spontaneous personal confessional style. This lens can be seen in one quote cataloging flowers. You realized that not even here did nature stand still. Trees lost their leaves, although never altogether. Flowers boomed in their seasons. You watched for Pudo as once for Hawthorne, for red lilies as for tulips, for Patria instead of lilac. So subtle attention to the details of the seasons from the previous list shows how amazing the period is to her narrative's focus on nature. In this way, the peer's centering on land, as well as its ownership and stewardship, constitutes an early, even pioneering contribution to the development of ecological consciousness in the Caribbean literary tradition. Finally, O'Callaghan finds that Napier's evocation of Dominica is indeed an insider's perspective. It is precise, particular, and celebratory at a period when many West Indian-born poets were rendering their landscapes with reference to classical or English literary models or as, or as exotic postcard views. I completely agree. As one last note, the novel's title of A Flying Fish Whispered encapsulates the nuanced but profound attention to nature. When Derek remarks that he is going to love her and not the island, the narrator describes that message. I said it so softly that she thought she must have dreamed he said it, thought that a flying fish had whispered, or a turtle rising to the surface to breathe. This metaphor conveys Derek's attitude and reflects Teresa's relationship to nature. She wants her love to be spontaneous and thrilling like a flying fish, yet it may be fleeting and quiet. Such a moving way to describe this affair, and one that offers a pioneering trail for Caribbean literature. Please use these sources to explore more about the book, its author, and colonialism in the Caribbean.